And don't, don't be afraid of the front seats down here. Uh, So we're still missing about 10, 10 students here. Uh, good, but you saved, you got the sound going, good. <clears throat> okay. All right, now we've, we've waited a little bit longer for everybody to be able to, to find the room uh, and, uh, and get the sound hooked up and get the... Uh, videoing going because of the the uh, video streaming that's going on and the, the filming of it so that you guys can have access to each of the lectures uh, on e-commons that if, for any reason to, if you miss something in the notes or you want to uh, get to look at what we're saying again uh, that it'll be available for you now uh, a couple, a couple things. Now, as I say, we're still, we're still missing about ten of the students. Uh, so I'm hoping that they're going to find their way here because there, there have been some difficulty. People who are on the wait list uh, because of them moving us to the larger room now are going to be able to get into the, into the course. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be able to accommodate most everybody that has applied. Uh, and we'll, so one, one of the administrative things I want to uh, deal with here at the beginning today is I would ask as a favor for you, if you would, uh, uh, when, you, when you come on Thursday, if you could bring a photograph of you with your name printed on the back of it, because what I want to do, I want to set up a thing like a, 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 a chart, like they have at law schools and graduate schools and stuff, so that I can uh, get to know who you are and, and uh, be able to you know, refer to you by name and get to know you by name so that I can recognize uh, who you are, okay? Now, that's, if, if you would do that, then, uh, then Toby will build a, a, a chart for us so that I can call on you by name and, uh, and when you raise your hand, I'll know who you are to call on you, okay? Uh, now, you've uh, uh, already already probably read one of the assignments, which is, and this is one I'd like to have you take a look at first if you haven't started reading the stuff yet, the, the uh, paradigm politics that is set forth on uh, the first week of reading in your syllabus. Uh, I'd ask you to read from page 73 to 114. There's, it's about 40 pages. But it's easy reading. It's not real heavy sledding. It's it's a it's a discussion of the range of options that were available to us as a country uh, at the end of the Cold War for a new organizing principle, uh, pursuant to which our our country could make policy decisions that had been trapped for some 80 years prior to that time. Uh, pursuing the, the dynamic of kind of a dialectical, confrontational uh, dynamic with the Soviet Union. That virtually every place in the world, when something happened, uh, we would rush in, the Soviets would rush in and take sides on the thing and, and have kind of proxy confrontations. Uh, but with the voluntary dissolution of the Soviet Union uh, on December 31st of 1991, the United States was faced with an opportunity to seek out some new alternative dynamic other than this dialogical confrontational dynamic. Uh, and what I've done is I've set forth in that uh, monograph uh, sort of what the range of options were at that time. So I'd like to just have you take a look at that if you haven't gotten to, to look at that yet. Uh, in that's uh, in that you can just click right onto it because it's there uh, in the syllabus. Now, secondly, for for Thursday, what I'd like to have you do is I'd like to have you uh, look at a couple specific readings. Uh, one of them is the reading, just a three the three page uh, reading from the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, having to do with natural law, and it uh, it talks specifically about. Uh, what the understanding in the philosophical community is of natural law 
And I want you to direct some special attention to the issue of nature and reason. Uh, it's a short, uh, a four-page, uh, a four-line section uh, on, uh, uh, in there. You'll see it. Uh, it's on page 452 uh, here in, in the encyclopedia that are, that are all put there for you. Uh, what week is that listed under? It's under uh, week, uh, week one, I think. Uh, it's, it's online in the e-commerce yeah. readings, it's, but it won't be on your hard copy syllabus because ah. it's updated last week. Okay, well I, can't, well, I can't access the e-commerce for some reason. Okay, okay well talk, talk, talk to Toby. Uh, we'll, we'll, get that, we'll get that solved, okay? So I'd just like to have you your, take, take a look at the, the section on natural law. And, uh, and then I'd like to have you read the section. It's real easy reading. It's a, and this is really a, a critical thing for the beginning of the course. Uh, it's called Natural Law and the American Constitution by Charles Desmond, a judge in the New York State Court of Appeals. It was in the Fordham Law Review. It's 10 pages, but it's really fairly fast reading. And what it's, do, what it's designed for is for people who are not pre-law or, uh, or government studies people to just familiarize yourself with, with what the general understanding is in the field about what the role of natural law is understood to have played in the founding of the Constitution. And we're going to go into a lot of detail about it here in the course, but I want you to get kind of a, a quick overview of what the understanding is here. It's just a short article, and it's just a, a, a little 10-page article, but it's, it's quick and easy reading. And there's a, a third uh, uh, article. This is a little heavier sledding. Uh, this is out of the American Journal of Jurisprudence. And what it is, is it's a, a discussion of metaphysics, epistemology, and the natural law theory. Now, you'll get used to what these terms mean here in the course. The philosophy majors are more familiar with what that means. But I just wanted to direct your attention to these, these few readings that I just want you to to get a handle on here uh, for, uh, for next Thursday when we get into, into this, okay? Uh, so now, uh, a, a, as you know, this is, uh, this is uh, Philosophy 155 and uh, Cowell 126. This is the discussion of the, uh, the actual constitutional crisis that <laughs> confronts us right now that may not be entirely obvious uh, to you, but that is a very real and serious one. And uh, what the role is of natural law in our Constitution uh, with regard to dealing with this uh, constitutional crisis. Now, for, for virtually your entire lifetimes, 21, 22 years of, of your lifetime, uh, you, like all of us, have been raised to believe that the United States is kind of the one exceptional nation uh, in the world. Uh, that in fact, above all others, that we in fact uh, present an opportunity uh, for democracy and human freedom and uh, equal opportunity. Uh, and that it, uh, it is the, the country in the whole world that really offers its own citizens, at least, the, uh, the best opportunity to fully develop uh, all of your potential. Uh, it's actually a concept that has been exported so that uh, a lot of people around the world have been led to believe the same thing that we believe as American citizens. And, uh, and we've, we've also been uh, led to understand that uh, the, the leadership of our country would very much like to make these same type of opportunities uh, for democracy and uh, equal protection and, uh, and uh, economic opportunities to get access to prosperity for people around the whole world. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to succeed in that uh, second desire, initially because of the uh, challenge that we faced uh, here in the United States with uh, the indigenous people uh, kind of resisting uh, our desire to, uh, to move out uh, across the country and make all of these opportunities available for everybody. For some reason they seem to have resisted uh, this uh, manifest destiny uh, on the part of our country. 
Uh, and, and then we were faced with the problem of these foreign imperialists, uh, like Britain to begin with, and later Germany, uh, you know, figuring on taking over the world and uh, imposing uh, unjust structures of one form or another upon uh, people, and they were harassing us and actually challenging us here in the United States. So it, we, we had to engage in a certain number of compromises uh, in order to confront them. And then, of course, there was that entire 80-year period when the communists uh, in Russia were basically uh, threatening the whole world, threatening to take over the whole world uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, basically subvert the United States and infiltrate the United States and uh, attempt to superimpose upon us the same type of authoritarian and atheistic uh, beliefs and structures that they had in the Soviet Union. And now, of course, more recently, we're faced with this other condition that's making it uh, difficult for us to export all of these values to the rest of the world, uh, being presented by these uh, Middle Eastern radical Islamists, uh, these extremists that uh, started out with Hezbollah, that uh, kidnapped uh, 52 of our uh, people from our American embassy in Tehran and held them for all that time. And then the Taliban uh, took over from them. And uh, then there was the uh, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda that were, uh, were led by Osama bin Laden. And uh, then there, of course, the ISIS or ISIL depending upon if you're a Republican or a Democrat, that, that uh, it presents a really major uh, problem to us because they're all, they all are devoted to trying to establish a global uh, caliphate uh, to bring Shia law in the, to, to the whole world uh, because they're, they, they believe in this distorted view of their, uh, their Islamic beliefs and that they believe that somehow they should impose their whole view upon us, especially here in the United States, because they hate our American way of life, uh, our freedoms, and uh, especially uh, women, uh, because uh, the, the women in, under their rule would not only not be allowed to drive cars, but they would have to basically wear a tent everywhere that they go, uh, and they aren't allowed to go outdoors without permission of their father. So that there's this, there's this desire on their part to superimpose this kind of global caliphate. Uh, and so that we have the, the burden, the responsibility for attempting to protect uh, everybody else from being uh, captured by them uh, and uh, had their heads cut off. Uh, so that, so that the, the uh, desire that we have to provide all of these extraordinary democratic rights and stuff for our people have to be temporarily curtailed. Uh, so that there, uh, there, there needs to be certain restrictions placed upon even us and ourselves in order to be able to sort out from amongst all of we innocent uh, civilians uh, those few radicals that would have infiltrated us. Uh, and so that uh, and, and, and while everything is, uh, is not entirely perfect here in the United States, one of the things that we're really good at here is that we're able to protect uh, religious freedom, that we're, we're uh, able to protect uh, ourselves and our citizens against these religious fanatics like ISIS and the Taliban who are trying to impose one particular religious view upon us. Uh, and also, uh, like the old times, back in, the, in Europe and in the, the Middle East where there was one basic religion that was foisted upon us, like in England, with the Church of England or the Roman Catholic Church that was going around uh, burning everybody at the stake uh, who didn't believe uh, what they were saying. Uh, and, and so that we, we were very good at protecting this particular right and even against people who would prohibit us from, from uh, pursuing any type of religion at all, like the Soviet Union. Uh, that we're, we're extremely good at this. And uh, secondly, uh, another major belief that we've all been raised with is that our American schools, 
our, our public schools, elementary and middle school and high schools and our junior colleges and universities have been uh, fairly good, uh, the academy, in training us and giving us uh, the ability to objectively and effectively uh, analyze uh, the present situation that we're confronted by at any given time and effectively analyze history, uh, which they give us some help on explaining it all to us, uh, and uh, getting some kind of general understanding of what's going on in the world. That our educational system has been uh, very good at, uh, at doing that and uh, enabling us to undertake this type of analysis. And that our churches and synagogues and the few mosques uh, that are around uh, have been fairly effective in imparting to us uh, because they're, they're, they're much more tolerant uh, af since, the, uh, since the Inquisition. Uh, they're, they're much more tolerant, and so therefore they have been able to effectively educate us uh, that it's perfectly okay if you don't believe in God, uh, uh, as long as you're really nice to people. Uh, and that uh, what's really important that you be nice to people and that you uh, at least try to figure out what, how to help do something for the least well-off. Uh, people that have been subjected to tornadoes or hurricanes or floods and stuff, and that uh, also the, the abused animals that you see, the ASPC ads that they have on television, and that we're even a good people here in the United States, and so we'll respond even to NBC News and CBS like, the poor individual girl who lost her father fighting in Afghanistan and she now has a lemonade stand and so that we'll all send in money uh, so that she'll end up with fifty thousand dollars or so to be able to have a lemonade stand so that we we've been we've been raised to believe that, uh, that by the churches and synagogues uh, and masks that that's basically okay uh, and that uh, but we as intelligent and well-educated people really understand that there's, there's really no God uh, out there somewhere, some white anthropomorphic guy sitting on a throne somewhere telling us what's uh, right and wrong. And so that therefore we're pretty much on our own uh, to be able to work together to figure out uh, how we're supposed to act toward each other and that uh, the operative choices that we have, uh, among which to choose, are pretty much laid out for us by the Republican and Democratic Party. Uh, and that you get the right to even do a little protest vote if you don't believe one of, or another of their particular political platforms to solve all of our problems. You can actually have a protest vote for the Green Party or the Libertarian Party or uh, even the Tea Party if you live in a trailer park somewhere. Uh, and that, and that uh, otherwise, uh, you know, we don't, we don't really have to work terribly hard, fortunately, each of us is just average citizens, to really figure these kind of things out. Uh, even though, as I said, we've been well trained by our schools to do that. And so we, we all generally have this general belief this good operational belief that, uh, that our whole country was founded by a group of people, a fairly small group of people who fled from Europe uh, because they were being persecuted uh, by these kings in royalist class to all have to believe one particular religion, whether it was Catholicism or a particular brand of uh, Protestantism like the, the, the Church of England etc., uh, in that our country was founded by this small group of people uh, and where we could all be free, that we could be free from the kind of royalists, uh, unfair taxation, uh, without representation, arbitrary arrest, you know, uh, and where uh, if you were arrested, they would basically, to figure out whether you were guilty or not, they would throw you in a big uh, tub of water and see if you floated, uh, or they would you know, scald your hand with a, a red hot sword and then wrap it all up and see if it got infected. You know, and that all those kind of loony things that they used to do uh, back in Europe. Uh, we are protected 
against that uh, type of thing. And most especially, we were protected from having them impose upon us some arbitrary and capricious set of religious beliefs. And that those people's uh, uh, great-great-grandsons, uh, people like George Washington and Benjamin Franklin and Alexander Hamilton and uh, Thomas Jefferson and a handful of these kind of really smart, benign, uh, kindly uh, guys uh, motivated by these same ideals of freedom uh, got together and they organized themselves to rise up against the oppressive uh, King of England, King George, uh, and basically throw off their arbitrary and capricious rule on behalf of the royalists and their aristocratic uh, friends. Uh, not, not that we're totally naive, and we, we realize that uh, there was some minor degree of kind of a mercantile interest on the part of some of the uh, people in, this cla in that class. Uh, you know, we're not rubes. You know, we, we understand that there was a little bit of that uh, going on, but, but for the most part, this was motivated by high ideals, uh, and that's why our country is set up to do that. And so the Constitution that these people set up uh, after throwing off this uh, arbitrary rule of the royalists and their aristocratic and ecclesial friends, this Constitution that was set up was uh, basically uh, set up uh, primarily to protect us from the new government we set up from a whole set of kind of arbitrary and capricious things that King George and his followers were engaged in uh, back during the colonial times. Uh, so there's basically a list of things there in the Constitution that, that are, they say they can't do to us. That, uh, that they, most of all, as I said, can't impose some religion on you. Uh, and they can't do things like the British used to do of closing down the newspaper if the newspaper printed something that was critical of King George or of England, uh, and they, they can't go running around breaking up our gatherings where we as colonists would gather together and uh, discuss our grievances uh, against uh, King George in England. And they, they can't just arbitrarily arrest us and detain us, uh, you know, without being able to go in front of a magistrate and prove that they possess some kind of probable cause to believe that we committed a crime of some sort. Uh, you know, there, there's a whole list of these things that, uh, that really uh, PO'd the people in the colonies and caused them to basically revolt uh, against King George and the British, uh, in that, therefore, they set forth in the Constitution a whole list of these little things that really, they were really peeved about. Uh, and that therefore the, the federal government that they set up aren't allowed to do those things anymore. Uh, and that uh, they, they had a whole bunch of technical rights in there that if you get arrested, uh, they have to follow. That, you know, if you're going to be put on trial, you have a right to cross-examine uh, the, the witnesses against you. You have a right to be told what it is that you've done that has caused you to be brought in front of the, the trial court. You have a right to... Uh, actually ask uh, uh, or present your own witnesses uh, in your defense and there's uh, and, and even to the point of having a right to a trial by jury so that the, the, the as we understand the Constitution in general terms uh, as average well-educated Americans we basically perceive it as a a list of little things that the government's not allowed to do and that in general, that we realize that it set up three branches of government. We're all taught that in high school civics. There's three branches of government, uh, and they have the executive branch, which is headed up by the president, and he's sort of like what the king used to be, except that they have to elect him. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it's got a bicameral legislature, which was sort of like the House of Lords and the House of Commons that was over in England that developed all that time. Uh, and then there's like the king's bench. There's a, there's a judiciary that functions uh, more or less independently from the others. So we, we, we have those general understandings about the Constitution and that this Constitution set up a government that is, a, is really a great improvement over the way things were in the colonies and back in Europe uh, where there was a tyrannical king and a whole aristocratic class of people that basically uh, lorded it 
uh, over uh, everybody else. Uh, and that we're aware of the fact that, that and, and you're aware of the fact that uh, it, prior to the 21 years or so that you've been alive, uh, there was a period where uh, these rights that have been set forth in the Constitution uh, were not, in fact, available to black people uh, and weren't available to women uh, or to Indians or Chinese people or Hindus or anybody other than white males. And that was a sad period, uh, and it's too bad that that period went on. But fortunately, things are much better now. That thanks to the democracy and the educational system that we have, uh, the progress that's been made by women, for example, now, that constitute 53% or so of the population, uh, are so much better that we see such progress made uh, just by being persistent that, uh, that uh, ideally this same kind of progress is going to be available for black people uh, and Chinese and Japanese people and Asian people, Puerto Ricans, Indians, other people who had been for this temporary period uh, not provided the same kind of equal rights. And I mean even, I mean like holy mackerel, even even gay and lesbian people. I mean, like that uh, just a, a while ago, just before you were born, people were considered to be criminals uh, and could be put in jail for being gay or lesbian. And now, here they are uh, marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade uh, in Boston. Uh, so that, that we have every reason to believe that this exceptional nation uh, into which we were privileged enough to be born uh, is doing pretty well all right. Uh, and that the whole system is functioning uh, quite well and that even in that instance where there are people who are truly uh, poor and can't in fact uh, protect themselves that out of the largesse of our legislature and our educational system and our people that we're willing to provide for those people who truly uh, can't uh, function because of some major physical disability or mental disability, et cetera. And, uh, and so therefore, we're doing all right. And the reality is that philosophy doesn't really have a hell of a lot to do with all of that. That this kind of progress that we've made down through all these years hasn't really been the function of people having a great grasp of philosophy or knowing what the difference is between Socrates or Plato uh, or Pythagoras or any of these other people that we hear talked about. Uh, that actually, philosophy itself is rather this kind of strange, arcane, uh, kind of actually uh, opaque discussion that goes on among kind of anally compulsive intellectuals that, uh, that basically are into parsing words and concepts and engaged in in what basically amounts to linguistic gymnastics. Uh, and that, uh, that it doesn't really play a very major role, it hasn't played a major role in our history. And that religion, religion is such, uh, is largely relegated to meetings on Sunday morning uh, and for Jewish people on Saturday. Uh, and it's, it's basically a lot of nerds. Uh, basically get together on Sundays, uh, but nobody, not many people here because we're sophisticated and intelligent people and, you know, we aren't likely to go spending Sunday morning uh, sitting in front of this thing listening to some usually rather effeminate uh, minister or priest uh, or now recently more kind of masculine women uh, pontificating to us about kind of platitudes uh, of, of kind of humanist values uh, in which they'll tell you that it really uh, is okay. It's okay if you don't really believe literally a lot of those things that were said in the Bible and even in the Gospels, as long as you kind of understand generally that these are kind of humanist values and that you should, as I said, be nice to people. And you don't really need to go to church to have somebody tell you that. Uh, and, you know, that basically they're, most of that time on the Sunday mornings they're spending their time talking you into contributing to the church so they can put a new roof on the church 
or something. That, that's generally how we understand uh, religion in our country. Because as I said, we're sophisticated, we're intelligent people, we're well educated, uh, and that uh, so religion itself doesn't really play a great role. It's a problem recently because of these kind of fundamentalist yahoos, uh, you know, that, uh, that are jumping up and down and they're, they're kind of crazed ultra right wingers uh, that are asserting uh, these kind of social values that are extremely reactionary. And so I mean, I'm, just, I'm just trying to be candid here among ourselves since it's just us and whoever's listening on the internet. Uh, but but the, so, so, so basically, uh, when we find ourselves confronted by a series of, of significant problems, uh, whether it's gli global climate change or terrorism or draconian uh, legislation, et cetera, uh, what do we do about it? We, we don't really engage in philosophical discussions about it. We certainly don't resort to any kind of uh, discussions of religious values much. And we don't really find it necessary to, to engage in any kind of aggressive exercise of our own constitutional rights. Uh, what we do is we basically turn to the same people in the Republican and Democratic parties uh, who have caused these problems to begin with. And so that we expect that they're going to basically get around to solving these problems. And the fact of the matter is things are going kind of okay for us anyway. Here we are in you know, Santa Cruz and you know, going to the university and uh, even if they raise the tuition a little bit, you know, we can get that covered uh, over the long run. Uh, but there's certainly uh, nothing much more dramatic that we really have to engage in. Uh, and uh, so, so therefore, uh, you're, you're uh, finding out that the, uh, the situation is much more serious than you thought it was, and that the problems that we're confronting are really much more serious than you thought, uh, and that the nature of those problems is uh, fundamentally different than you've been taught. Uh, by the academy and by the major news media and by the two major political parties uh, that the, the fact that it's worse doesn't really trouble you much yet. Uh, so that's why you're taking this course. So that you're going to find out not only that the, the situation is a lot more serious than you thought, but that the nature of the problems are much different than you've been led to believe that they are. Because if you listened to the, major, the two major political parties and the major news media and uh, even most of the academy, uh, you, you would think that sort of there's, a, there's basically like half a dozen kind of major problems that are confronting us as a whole people as distinct from your particular problems, you know, about having to get good grades and pay back your school loans and find a mate and figure out what you want to do uh, to make money in your life. Uh, but as, as a whole, our people, uh, according to the, the sources of the Republican Democratic Party, the news media, and the academy, there's about a half a dozen problems that are primarily facing us right now, one of which is uh, this uh, ISIS. Uh, or ISIL, uh, these radical Islamists, the fundamentalists that are basically uh, threatening us uh, all over the world uh, and threatening to come into our country and uh, blow up uh, places like the, uh, the Trade Center or the Pentagon uh, or you know, blow us up if we're running around having a, a marathon in Boston. Uh, this is a really serious problem and in fact it's getting even more serious because there are now some uh, 180 homegrown terrorists, uh, people like you and me that are Americans, that are actually running over there and uh, getting training by the Al-Qaeda or the uh, ISIL uh, and being trained to be terrorists and looking up on the internets how to make bombs and stuff. Uh, so, I mean, this, this is sort of being pitched to us right now as the major uh, problem uh, or challenge that is confronting us uh, as Americans. 
and the second major problem is this Iran group. Uh, Iran is trying to get a nuclear weapon. I mean, you know, we know all about that. I mean, we see it on the news all the time. There's been this huge, dramatic set of uh, negotiations that have gone on that John Kerry has been leading diligently uh, and has finally gotten Iran to agree for a temporary period of time to uh, refrain from doing those kind of things that could uh, give them an immediate short-term access to a nuclear weapon. Uh, and that, oh, thank God for John Kerry uh, and Obama that have been able to, to get that deal struck here to postpone this potential time when uh, the Iranians would have a nuclear weapon uh, that would enable them to sort of dominate the entire Middle East and uh, to uh, cut off our supply of oil. Uh, well, actually, the, the supply of our oil uh, that's there in the Middle East that uh, belongs to, as a matter of contract, to the seven major oil corporations that are part of Aramco, the American, the Arab American uh, Petroleum uh, Grouping. And of course, that if they get a nuclear weapon, they're going to be threatening Israel, uh, our major ally in the Middle East, and they could become a threat to the Suez Canal uh, that is there, that enables uh, the West to actually uh, engage in, uh, in navigation, in, uh, in commerce with the, with the Far East. So this, this is another problem, along with the uh, general Islamicist and uh, fundamentalist, uh, this, this thing with Iran. Even though, even though we're sophisticated and we know that they're not uh, Sunni radicals like these other guys, like ISIL and these other people, uh, they're uh, something else. The, they are, in fact, uh, Shia. Isn't that far out? So that there's two different groups over there. But... The fact is, they're both kind of nuts. Uh, I mean, you got the Sunnis on one side, and you got the Shias on the other side, and, and so you can't really side with the Shias against the Sunnis, even though you know the Sunnis are bad because they're, they're all these, uh, these people cutting people's heads off. But you can't really side with the Shia either because, I mean, hell, I mean, they're Iranians. Uh, and so that we've got a problem. We've got a serious problem that we all have to figure out how to deal with here as, as Americans. And that there's a third problem which is, of course, China. Uh, and it's not, we're not dealing right now with the fact that China may become a growing economic power, et cetera. But the fact is, is that China uh, has been giving us loans for a long time. And the fact is they've been buying U.S. Treasury bonds, uh, and uh, there's always the chance that they'll stop buying them uh, or that they'll end up uh, cashing them in and requiring us to pay them for that and they could bankrupt the entire economy and, uh, and drive us back into an economic crisis. Uh, and of course now, gee, we've got that problem with Russia again. Uh, here's Putin, you know, this guy that, you know, we can all make lots of fun of him. You know, he rides around with his shirt off and he's kind of a nutty dude. Uh, he's not like Gorbachev, <laughs> that really nice guy that, uh, that knew enough to, you know, disarm their nuclear weapons and try to establish peace. We got Putin back in there, who's another one of these nutcases, and that uh, Russia could therefore be reasserting itself by invading the Ukraine and uh, in, uh, in, in threatening uh, Chechnya and other places with military power. And the, the, we could then have them threatening uh, all of Eastern Europe again to try to take them back under uh, their control. And uh, fifthly, there's this uh, major problem we still have. Remember, we've just gotten out of this major economic crisis uh, that we've seen here. We came really close to losing the whole thing here with our economic system. That I mean, uh, thank, thank, thank God that Obama was willing to give, you know, 40 or 50 billion dollars. How much was that anyhow? 70 billion dollars a year? It's whatever difference it makes. Uh, they, they gave him all that money. Uh, to the banks to, to keep them from falling apart after they had basically swindled uh, the entire country by uh, inflating the price of homes and, uh, and then selling the debt uh, over and over and over again and uh, bribing the regulators. Uh, but, but the fact is, we all just sat back and said, well, hell, give them $80 billion and that'll solve it. 
Uh, and so we said, great, okay, so our taxes will go up a little bit more and we'll have to give them all that money. But, I mean, they all know what they're doing. That's the, because, I mean, the Republicans and Democrats both agreed to do that. But we have to be careful. We have to be careful, of course. We can't, in fact, you know, ratchet down on them too tightly uh, and, and restrict them too much. So these, uh, the, the, this whole thing of the Dodd-Frank rules and regulations that are going to re-regulate all those banks and savings and loan companies, you don't want to get too aggressive about all that. So the fact that nobody has gone to jail, nobody has been punished for that entire bizarre episode shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't really, which was completely different, he was just swindling people out of their private investments. But this is a, the, the whole bottom line is, is that we don't have to be too distressed about that as long as we don't overdo it. As long as we don't over-regulate them or over-restrict them and have our economy go back into a nosedive. So those are, those are the uh, major half dozen serious problems that are confronting us as Americans right now. Uh, wh whereas uh, it turns out that the, the, the nature of any important challenges that really confront us are virtually totally different than that. Uh, but, but the fact is, is that both political parties uh, and in fact news media and basically the academy all agree that those are the things that we should really be worried about. And so uh, we, don't have to, we don't have to do anything more than rely upon our political parties to solve this problem. Uh, and and uh, moreover, uh, what has all this got to do with philosophy or the Constitution or certainly uh, natural law? What, is, what has this got to do with anything? I mean, after all, the Constitution is basically a document that is designed for us domestically. And a lot of these things are primarily international or global problems and that uh, our Constitution is really designed just domestically to make sure that our, that our government functions uh, effectively. Okay, yes? Okay, so I was wondering, obviously several of the problems allegedly facing us are really not that big. For instance, if you, if you look up Great Recession versus Great Depression, and you saw the two being compared repeatedly in the news media, but if you look it up, the Great Depression looks like woo, and the Great Recession looks like woo. Um, but um, anyways, though, so obviously a lot of those aren't real threats, but in terms of, say, what you're talking about with Iran and nuclear proliferation, that is a very real problem. It may not be something we should, we need to do anything about, because, I mean, that's kind of Iran's business, but it would be really nice if it weren't going on, because it's scary. Okay, so let's, so let's discuss that a little bit. Like, uh, okay, the United States is all irate about the fact that Iran is trying to develop a nuclear weapon. And doesn't it strike anybody as a little strange that the United States that has thousands of nuclear weapons uh, somehow has gotten on its high horse and says this is outrageous, the idea that you should have nuclear weapons. And, and excuse me, and the fact is, is that it turns out that the United States is the one that gave the nuclear materials to Israel for them to have 400 nuclear weapons. And yet, the fact that the United States is becoming absolutely indignant about the fact that someone else would want to have nuclear weapons doesn't seem to distress the news media, uh, doesn't seem to distress the academy. I mean, nobody's talking to you about how completely patently absurd this entire thing is. Uh, you know, the fact that in the Karen Silkwood case, which I happen to have been chief counsel on, that when Karen Silkwood was murdered out in Oklahoma, back in 1973, on our way to deliver internal documents from the Kerr-McGee Nuclear Corporation to David Burnham from the New York Times, uh, revealing that they were missing 40 pounds of 98% pure bomb-grade plutonium, which in fact they were smuggling to Israel and Iran, as it, as it turns out. Uh, and so that the, the, the absolute hypocrisy of the entire issue of asserting that Iran having access to nuclear weapons is this horrible catastrophe in the whole world and that we have to all mobilize and even consider using unilateral U.S. military power to, to blow up 
their facilities if they don't agree to, to do this, uh, to get rid of those things, uh, is in fact suggesting that the nature of the problem relating to nuclear weapons and nuclear materials and the proliferation of nuclear materials is substantially different than how it's being presented to you by the two political parties and by the major news media and even by the academy. Uh, and so that what we're going to do in this course is we're going to explore some of these issues and figure out what the nature of the real problem is that they represent and uh, very importantly uh, direct our attention to why in the world the Constitution of the United States has anything to do with solving these problems. And, and more importantly, why does this concept of natural law, which it may be of some interest to philosophy majors, etc., why is that so pertinent to really attempting to address the nature of the real problems that we have or the real nature of the problems that they're suggesting that we be worried about? That's what, this, that's what the course is, is uh, going to be about. Uh, and I would suggest that what we're going to do is we're going to direct our attention in analyzing the pertinence of the Constitution and the pertinence of natural law, that we're going to be directing our attention to what are, in fact, real problems, substantial problems, uh, which are still being aggressively denied by a significant plurality of the members of Congress, uh, people in both political parties, uh, and in a sense by the entire political structure, that when you have the United Nations International uh, Panel on Climate Change uh, insisting that we reduce by 70 percent the annual global greenhouse gas emissions and we have the United States administration advocating 7%, like as if they got the decimal place in the wrong spot. Uh, and, that, and, and still, the, the majority of people in both houses of the, of the House and Senate are insisting that they don't want to have any restrictions on it. Because in fact, it isn't even real. Even though there are 2,000 major climate scientists who set forth all of the evidence demonstrating this true and we still continue to rely upon that same system to solve the problem. So that uh, we're going to be looking at this issue of global climate change and trying to determine what relevance our Constitution uh, has to attempting to figure out ways of solving this because if in fact what we're being told by the global uh, scientists is true that in fact that we're looking at massive inundation of the the seashores uh, up to you know 10 miles uh, of the seashores of the entire world being inundated by 2100 uh, and that over 50 percent of the entire human population is going to have to migrate away from the sea coasts and, uh, and move into territories that are already occupied by other people. And that some two-thirds of the entire uh, fresh water on the planet is going to be lost uh, by the melting of the polar ice caps and the, the, uh, the dissolving of the glacier fields that feed the, the, the rivers of our world and contaminate the underwater uh, aquifers along the sea coasts where another, another one-third of the, the fresh water exists. You know, if, in fact, those things are true, people ought to be considering some fairly radical action. And when you start talking about radical action, you're talking about the Constitution of the United States. You're talking about uh, how it is that you're going to be able to engage in this kind of radical action, radical action that was analogous to what was done in the colonies in opposition to the royalists, in opposition to the same aristocrats in Europe uh, that generated the French Revolution, et cetera. Yes? Um, I just, <coughs> I was reading this paper and it was just like on how climate change is going to affect like Africa. It's like 
climate and how it's going to be like really good to grow food there. Yes. And, and then how China's buying tons of land. And I wasn't too sure if like America was making steps as China was to buy land in Africa. Like I don't know what America's policy is on that, but like I know that China's buying like vast amounts of like land in Africa just so that like they can potentially grow food. I don't know. If, like, well, the, 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 actually a lot of the of what's going on on the part of China in Africa is uh, purchasing areas that have oil uh, in it. And the fact is that there's a massive increase in the desertification in Africa because that's some of the hardest hit areas of the world because of global climate change. Uh, and so that the, the, the policies on the part of the United States are, are shockingly uh, out of keeping with really addressing what it is that's going on. You know, so that when you, you find the, the melting of the polar ice caps and you have the United States, uh, one of the, the, the majority political party in the House and Senate, advocating that they increase the subsidies to the oil and petroleum corporations so that they can drill oil now up in the uh, Arctic, now that the ice is melted, so that they can put up more carbon into the atmosphere, I'm suggesting that uh, something is seriously wrong. And that what I'm suggesting in this course is, is that if in fact your generation and mine together choose to undertake the kind of radical action that may well be necessary to stop what's going on now, you're going to want to know about the Constitution of the United States. You're going to want to know how healthy it is, how effective it is, uh, to what degree has the rights been diminished that you are not going to be able to exercise. And that's going to be part of the subject matter of this course in how the philosophy of natural law relates to the ability that we're going to have to utilize those particular constitutional rights. Yes? Um, so you're saying that like, the political um, powers that are uh, in control right now are basically concealing the main issues that we should be focusing on. But what I'm wondering, is like, what is the major issue, if you were to pick one, um, as to why they are doing that? Is it the uh, influence of transnational corporations? Um, is it because of the economy? Why would you say that? The, the, the very, you, you're very aware of what the problem is. It's because of the massive bribing that is going on on the part of the transnational corporate uh, corporations uh, of the major legislators. That uh, you, you have right now, the, the, the fact is, is that the, uh, the, uh, you, you've heard some of the information about it. The, 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 the fact of the matter is that by the year 2016, as of next year, the 1% the the richest people, of uh, the 1% of people on our planet uh, are going to own 51% of all of the natural resources in the world. Okay? Uh, that's 1% of them. And that two-thirds of the adults in the world, uh, all taken total, only, only control 3% of the wealth on the planet. In the, of the major transnational corporations, of the, of the top 25 of them, like almost 20 of them are oil companies. And the, and the others are pharmaceutical corporations that are actually part of the, pe the petrochemical industry. Uh, for, uh, for the chemical companies that are making fertilizers. Uh, in, so that, that what, you, what you see is that there's a major hold that the transnational corporations have now asserted over the decision-making processes of a democratic legislature. And, and that's what the major problem is right now. Because there's, there's a movie that, that you may be able to get it now on, on uh, your computers, but it's called Merchants of Doubt. Uh, and, uh, and Jeff Kroll, uh, or Jeff Skoll, and the people from Participant Films have made a major documentary about it where they're showing the, the small handful of PR firms that have been hired by the petroleum corporations to basically just deceive everybody by the, the same exact people that were hired to, by the tobacco corporations to actually hide and conceal their own internal documents that made it clear to them that they were generating cancer and that they were in fact putting, intentionally putting chemicals into their cigarettes to physically addict people uh, to their cigarettes, uh, knowing that it was giving them cancer. 
and yet sitting and testifying in front of Congress, the CEOs of all the tobacco corporations, that they did not in fact have any evidence indicating that this was causing cancer. You know, and, and the, the state and, and the legislature is doing absolutely nothing to punish those people. Okay, so the, the, the answer to it is, is as you've suggested, is that these major corporations, that, and, and we're going to focus on this question uh, preliminary to looking at the Constitution and the, the issue of natural law to try to figure out what remedies are available to us in light of what the nature of the real problems are. That what we're doing in these first few classes is orienting you away from these kind of illusory problems that are being uh, propagandized uh, by the national news media. Uh, NBC, of course, of which is owned by General Electric, which happens to produce most of the fighter engines uh, and engines for the Black Hawk helicopters, et cetera, uh, that are used to, to uh, establish hegemony over all these different places of the world where the oil and petroleum is. And uh, ABC is owned by Cap City, which is in fact the, the CEO of which uh, was actually William Casey, the director of our Central Intelligence Agency. You know, and the, 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 but the, 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 the point is that I, what I want you to do is I want you to calmly <coughs> be able to take a look at what it is that's going on. Uh, and now that, now that the Soviet Union has dissolved, the other side doesn't have any credibility anymore when they come running out and saying, you must be a communist. You, know, you, must, you must be loyal to the Soviet Union <coughs> because you're actually criticizing corporate capitalism. And what we're saying now is that we are now free after the end of the Cold War to be able to talk about these things and come to a firm understanding of what the real nature of the problem is that these people are causing. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing in the course. I've got two hands. Um, to um, go off of what you just said about the international corporations, is that why, like, Governor Jerry Brown is, like, mandating, like, uh, all these water restrictions, but, like, not doing anything for, like, Nestle or, like, all these all like, like, the meat industries that are using the most water, but, like, going down hard on all these consumers. Well, the, 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 fact, the fact of the matter is, is that if you have a system where you have a, an instrument like ca a, a, a corporation, a capitalist corporation, where individuals can purchase shares of all of the assets and resources of a given company, and they're completely immune from any liability uh, for what that company does, and the management are completely immune from any personal liability. And the, the only liability runs to the assets that are actually in the bank and owned by that corporation. And the lawyers that they pay set up subgroups to isolate out limited numbers, uh, amounts of resources so that that's all that's vulnerable. Okay, and you have that system. And you have the lawyers that work for those corporations get appointed to the courts to be able to make the argument that those corporations have a First Amendment right to contribute as much money as they would like to the campaigns of the legislatures. Uh, and those legislatures vote over and over and over again to grant rights to those people, like in the Clean Air Act, where they authorize, expressly authorize those corporations to pump thousands and thousands of tons uh, of, of uh, pollutants into the atmosphere and pour them into the rivers and that they're specifically immunized against any liability for it. I mean, it doesn't take rocket science to really understand what it is that's going on. And yet what they've done is they've, they've set up a, a system of taboos whereby you're not allowed to talk about that. If you start talking about that, they're going to, they're going to uh, uh, isolate you out and say that you're radical, because they can't say you're a communist anymore. And so what they're going to start doing is they're going to start suggesting that you're lending material support to terrorists. Because the terrorists understand who the problem is, because they're sitting, they're sitting there in their countries in the Middle East taking over their Middle Eastern oil fields. You know, and they understand in Africa who they are, 
because they're there taking over all of their territory where the, where the uh, petroleum is. So, so what I'm saying is, is that, that what I, I want to do preliminary to our focused discussion on the Constitution and our detailed discussion of natural law and what its, what its relationships are to the Constitution, I want us to have a clear grasp of why it is that this is relevant. What it is that you think you really need to do in order to deal with these major crises that are going to be confronting you in your life. Uh, because, you know, here you are at 21, 22 years old, you know, you've got another 80 years out in front of you. And this is the exact period during which this massive inundation of the seacoast is going to be taking place. And the fact of the matter is that there are almost 400 uh, nuclear power plants that are all within a mile of the seashores all across the world. Uh, so, you know, if you think Fukuyama is, uh, you know, a, a problem, one, one nuclear facility in Japan, you know, the fact of the matter is if you, have a, if you have a sea rise increase of 40 feet across the planet during your adult lives, uh, they're going to be inundating these nuclear power plants and all of that radioactivity is going to go into the sea and start killing off the plankton at the very base of the food chain. You know, so what, what I'm saying is, is that you, the, the, the simple message is that you need to start considering really radical action to protect yourselves and to protect the other people of the world and to protect the future generations of the world. So what I would actually say to you is you, you basically find yourself in what you might otherwise consider to be a science fiction movie. You know, that here you are confronted by this absurd situation, you know, where the, 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 the leadership of the country and the world is being just as absurd as in one of these science fiction movies, where the hero is attempting to organize to do something about it. And I'm suggesting that if you're going to organize to do something about this, then you have to know about the Constitution. And you have to try, we have to try to figure out what De continued viability there is in the Constitution uh, so that if you're going to organize and do the kind of things that you need to do, if you are in fact moved against by the major uh, leadership of the two political parties, both of which are complete captives of the transnational corporations, that you're going to know what you're going to do about it. Because the second major problem that we're confronted by the real problem that we're confronted by, in addition to the global climate change that I'm talking about, in the captivity of the major legislatures by the transnational corporations, the second major problem we're confronted by, in reality, is the rise of this national security state here in the United States. That uh, after 9-11, after you have the entire uh, elucidation of the Patriot Act, where, I mean, is, is there anybody in the room who doesn't know that all of your cell phone conversations are being recorded by the National Security Agency. Is there anybody here who doesn't know that? You didn't know that? Okay. And Isn't it just the meta tags or something like that? Pardon? The metadata, like who you're calling, where you're calling. Yeah. No, what, no, what they, no, no, actually what they do is they, they are, that, the metadata, they're able to just look at regularly. The rest of it they record and they store away. And they're now asserting that that's okay because they have to get a warrant to go look at it. Okay? So that it's not as though they're spying on you. They're just collecting all the information. And then they're saying that they have to get a warrant. And say, what kind of warrant is that? Is it probable cause to believe you committed a crime of some sort? No. It's a warrant that's, <clears throat> that's issued by an executive branch officer predicated upon his assumption that there is, there, there may, there's reasonable grounds to suspect that information of potential interest to the national security of the United States may be in, on one of your conversations. Okay, so that, that's, that's how the argument they're making now. It comes from the original requirement in the Constitution of the United States that all persons are to be secure in their person, in their, their papers and their effects, that they're to be secure against any search unless there is a warrant. 
that has been issued by an independent judicial officer predicated upon their conclusion that there exists evidence that it's more probable than not that you have committed a crime, a specific crime, and that the evidence to show that you've committed the crime is there in the narrow place that's to be searched. And yet, here we are with having all of your telephone conversations recorded, all of your internet communications recorded, and they're building a gigantic facility in Utah now, uh, like six blocks by six blocks long, to, to uh, store all the recordings, and they're making an argument that you shouldn't be distressed about this because they have to have one of their own people say that he believes that there's reasonable grounds to suspect that something in your telephone conversations might be of relevance to the national security of the United States. And if, in fact, you're trying to organize to shut down the major transnational corporations that are, in fact, you know, pillaging the, the, the materials around the world to come into our economy, they may well think that that's, in fact, threatening the national security of the United States. You know? And more importantly, there's nobody to review it because there's no provision for review of that inside the statutes, okay? Uh, and not only that, but, the, but when it was under the W. Bush administration, they just kept flat out lying and saying they weren't even doing it. They were actually appearing in front of congressional committees and saying, no, that's not true, we aren't doing that at all. And even after they proved that they were doing it, not a single thing was done to any of those officials who got in front of them and lied. You see, so, so what I'm suggesting to you is that, that things are a lot worse off than you're being told. And that the action that's going to be necessary to do anything about it is going to have to be more radical than you suspect. That is, that you can't just rely upon the Republican and Democratic Party to do it for you. You know, and you, can't, you aren't going to be able to call up the New York Times and tell them about it and expect that they're going to publish it on the front page of the paper because they already know it. You see, that, that's what I'm saying to you. And so that, that's why you need to know about the Constitution. You need to know about what the entire theory is behind the Constitution, not just this kind of sophomoric understanding uh, of the Constitution that I set forth at the beginning of the class, you know, which is basically all that you're really taught you know, by the academy. Uh, which includes all the way from grade school on through high school to college. You know, you're you're going to have to have a much better understanding of the Constitution. You're going to have to have a much better understanding of what the options are that are available for you. And you're going to have to have a very clear understanding of what the nature of the problem is that you have to deal with. And so that, that's, the, that's the purpose of the course that, that, uh, that we, we're doing now. Because this national security state has been rolling into place for some time now. Uh, but that they've, they've been using the 9-11 event uh, as the key rationale for doing all of this and that they're, they're anticipating that you're going to be afraid. You're going to be afraid to confront them in any kind of meaningful way. Because if you try to confront them in a meaningful way, they're going to start suggesting that there's something wrong with you that you're unpatriotic, that you're somehow supportive of terrorism. Uh, and that's why they have removed from the requirements for picking you up off the street with no probable cause to believe that you've committed any crime whatsoever, with no warning to your families, no knowledge on the part of your families or friends that they've taken you, and to hold you without any type of uh, judicial proceeding as long as they want to predicated not upon you're actually providing any type of material support to terrorism, but any type of significant support, even to the point of you raising fundamental questions about what it is that the United States is doing that is causing those people to be acting the way they are. Okay, That in and of itself could in fact reasonably be interpreted on their part as subjecting you to this type of rendition. And I'm not just guessing at that because the United States Attorney in the Southern District of New York 
actually took that position. In, in, in the case of Chris Hedges and Dan Ellsberg, when they filed a, a major uh, federal complaint uh, against the National Defense Authorization Act, Section 1021 and 1022, and said that you know, they believed that their mere interviewing anybody who was involved in the, with the terrorists and getting their side of the story could in fact be interpreted as providing substantial support for them and therefore could justify sweeping them off the street, locking them up, and holding them for as long as they wanted to without any right of habeas corpus. That is, without any right to have a judicial officer review your incarceration. So I'm suggesting to you that you need to know a lot more about what the situation is. And you need to know a lot more about the Constitution and what you can really do with it and what the underlying thesis is or ethos of the Constitution, which is rooted in natural law, you need to understand a lot more about natural law to know how to develop these arguments that you're going to have to have. Yes? Did I pass right by your question? Or? Yeah. Um, so a couple questions. When you were talking about like, the, um, the national security state, which is uh, now becoming more and more powerful, so how much of a threat is it really to us as technology users, if I'm texting my friend and I text something like, I wonder what the response would be if somebody blew up uh, some building. How likely is it actually that like, I'm going to be like, arrested? That one will do it. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, that, that, that'll, get, that, that'll get the FBI at your door. You know? And so you say to yourself, how did they know what I said? You know, if in fact they're, they're telling the truth that all they're doing is recording it, and they're not listening to it uh, because they're listening to all the stuff on the grounds that they're looking for child <coughs> pornography. See, they, they've come up with this great, you know, gut kicker of like, nobody wants to have these uh, pedophiles and child pornographers being able to get away with it. And if they, they take a popular vote among the people and the people say, yeah, I think you ought to be able to stop those people. Uh, you know, we don't want our kids being, you know, raped and, and pillaged. So therefore, if you want to listen to the, the uh, things that are going on on the internet, looking for that type of thing, it's okay with us. And of course, they take the position that when they're looking for that kind of thing, and they happen to come across other stuff, if it if it's generates any kind of suspicion on their part that you might, in fact, be engaged in any kind of conduct that would constitute substantial support for terrorism, they're going to scoop it right up. Okay, so, so what, what I'm saying to you is that they are laying down an absolute total dragnet uh, on all of your communications, all of your internet, all of your, your iPhones, all of your telephone conversations at your home phones. All of that stuff is being sucked up into the maw of a major national security state. Okay, and, and the, 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 the bottom line is that what you really need to understand is that this is not being done in good faith. This is not just a mistake on their part uh, because these people are driven at base by an ideology that you do not understand. You know, that these people are not just afraid of the fact that the Hezbollah or other people are going to come blow up the Trade Center again. These people are devoted to establishing full spectrum dominance over the planet. They are dedicated to, to, uh, to taking into their control and possession all of the strategic raw materials that they deem to be necessary for them to be the, the overwhelming and undisputable hegemonic force on the planet. And it's that exact same thing that they accuse the other bad guys of being involved in, such as the Nazis and the communists and the, the, the Russians and all of that. The, the, matter, the fact of the matter is that that is exactly the objective that they're engaged in. And you shouldn't be surprised about that if, in fact, they're, they're driven and controlled by corporations that have absolutely no other objective but to, mass, to, to uh, increase their, their personal profits. Their sole objective is to increase their personal profits. They have no conscience. 
They have no soul and they have no responsibility, the people that own the assets or run the companies. So, so again, it doesn't take rocket science to understand that setting up that type of a set of structures is going to generate that type of heartless and soulless type of conduct. Yes? Um, we've been talking about how climate change is becoming one of the biggest issues that we're facing right now, and especially how corporations have been doing not nearly as much as they should be doing to I didn't say anything like that. Greenhouse. I'm but saying they're causing it. <laughs> They're causing it with full knowledge. Okay. Um, how would you react to the theory that it would actually be good for corporations for climate change to go on the way it is because then they can sell things like oxygen tanks for people that are less rich and can't actually afford the good oxygen when it's well, at such I, a low I would, level? I would, I would think it's very much like the argument that it's okay for them to kidnap you and cut both your legs off because then they can sell you prosthetics. You know? I mean, and if that's what we're looking for, plus they'd be able to pay the hospital for all of that surgery and stuff that you had to do. You know, so why not? If, if all you're caring about is, is, you know, stimulating more economic activity to give them more profits, regardless of what the pain is that's imposed upon individual people or their rights, well then sure, that those, those would be completely reasonable arguments. So, do you think these kind of like fundamental problems are created by unfair, like overtly unfair and corrupt trade practices or like overt violations of the Constitution as opposed to like being in, intrinsic to the capitalist economic system or its tie with democratic liberalism? I mean, it seems like we're only interpreting these problems in terms of capitalist economics or in terms of violations of human rights. So like we only are really seeing it as a problem because differences in who has money or whether or not rights were violated. It, it's, it's, there's a challenge in your question there because the, the fact of the matter is the Constitution of the United States was not drafted up to restrict the activities of corporations. Right. You know? So I mean the corporations theoretically are not violating your civil rights because the civil rights are designed to protect you against the government. And the problem is now that they've taken over the government. And the government is allowing them to do all of these things. And they're, they're doing so pursuant to what they're suggesting is the due process of law. It's very similar to what happened in Germany in the 1930s. They just, they just step by step passed statutes and laws uh, with open democratic elections, uh, authorizing them to seize all the property of the Jewish people you know, to put the gypsies in concentration camps and stuff. And the, so the, the, they're suggesting that as long as they follow certain rules, uh, th it's okay for them to do it. Uh, and the whole idea of the Constitution is that no matter how many people support a particular concept of restricting the rights of a given individual, the government is without authority to do that. They cannot do that. So they cannot, in fact, authorize these people to do this. And the corporations are creatures of the government. They are, they are created. They're false entities that are created by the government. They actually give a license to the corporations to do the kind of things that they're doing. And so you have to trace it back to the action of the government itself uh, as to what it is. And, so, and we'll, we'll deal with that because that's a, a good lawyer question of how to, how to deal with these things, okay? So just let me get to this, because it, I, I want to be able to open it up for, for general questions here. But um, the, the, uh, the third major crisis, in addition to the onset of massive global climate change and the rise of this national security state, is the whole issue of the potential rising probabilities of a direct global military confrontation between the Northern Industrial Alliance, led by the United States, and the new Asian Empire, led by China. So no matter what type of kind of uh, soporifics that you're hearing about how, well, we've got ongoing discussions going on with China and trade agreements with China and they're lending us money, et cetera. I mean, the, the reality of the, of the thing is, is that the leadership of the Chinese government are just as convinced that they're entitled to uh, be the major hegemonic force in the world as the Caucasian leadership of the United States government is. And so that the reality is, is that the threat that we're faced with here as the third major challenge is the potential rising of a fundamental dialectical confrontation 
between the new Asian empire led by China and the Northern Industrial Alliance led by the United States. In that regard, I would, I would recommend to you, uh, you don't have to read this, but I'm saying you, you ought to know about it. This is the clash of civilizations and the remaking of the world order. Uh, this is a, a major piece that was written by Samuel Huntington, who is the, the, the major professor of international relations, or was till he passed away, at Harvard University. And he is also the co, was the co editor of Foreign Affairs Magazine, which is the principal publication of the Council on Foreign Relations. And he, he was also the president of the American Association of Political Science. This is no minor person. And what he is doing in this book was published in 1993. It was an earlier article from 1990, uh, it was his 1996, from an earlier article in 1993 in Foreign Affairs magazine in which he openly advocates that the people in Western culture buckle down and start preparing for a major economic, cultural, and military confrontation with China. Uh, and that in order to do so, we have to stop all of this multiculturalism and we have to get down to getting everybody basically to believe in Judeo-Christian ethics. And that the Judeo-Christian ethical system is what distinguishes us from the rest of the world. And therefore, we have to purge our culture and society of all of these other ancillary views. Uh, and uh, I would strongly recommend that you read this only because if you don't read it, you won't believe it. Uh, that a person of that stature and that degree of influence has said what he has said. And this is uh, at the root of a major conversation that is going on uh, in the highest circles of government right now. And so I'm just suggesting that uh, in preparation for our discussion of the Constitution and of the role that natural law plays in the fleshing out the powers and limitations uh, on, on our government, that I just want you to understand what these three major crises are all about, okay? And that what we're going to do is on Thursday, uh, we're going to take up this conversation uh, about the Constitution, and we're going to start with this question of whether or not the mechanism of a dialectic between the West and China is in fact the natural order of things. That in fact, history plays itself out pursuant to a dialectical dynamic. That in fact, we had the 80 years of the confrontation between Russia and the United States, the East and the West, communism versus capitalism. Uh, and that uh, according to Hegel, uh, that the, that is how history plays itself out. That is a, the assertion of a specific thesis in the particular case of the confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States, it was the thesis in the West of Caucasian, nation-state-based, uh, imperialist capitalism versus the antithesis of non-Caucasian-based, non-nation-state-based, international communism. And that those were the antipodes that were in direct conflict. Uh, and that, that that for 80 years was kind of a functional endorsement of the pr primary thesis of Hegel, that this is how history has to play itself out. And now the advocates of that particular worldview, which we'll find is the second paradigm worldview that we're going to be discussing in the octave of worldviews that are available, each with its own particular generic philosophy, uh, that, that that particular worldview believes that that is how it ought to be. And that unless you are on one side or another of that dialectic, you aren't getting it. Okay? So that, that's what we're going to be, we're going to be discussing this starting on Thursday. So I want you to do those, those uh, readings that I suggested uh, so that we'll be prepared for the discussion then. Okay, so that, that gives us the remaining 15 minutes or so to have 
have questions, and we, we have to clear this room at 545 apparently every day because there's a whole other group of bright young people such as yourself getting ready to flow in here for a new class. Okay? So let's, let's get them here. Yes? So I guess uh, part of the Patriot Act is going to be reauthorized or is supposed to be authorized on June 1st. Yeah. Um, what would have to happen for that conversation about the dissolution of the NSA to actually come to fruition? There'd have to be a new political party. Because none of those, because 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 none, none of none of those people are going to raise this issue, you know, because they'd be terrified of being castigated as being pro-terrorist, you know, and to somehow not have allow the NSA to do all this surveillance. Okay, so let's get first questions from other people, then we'll get other second and third questions. Yes. Um, so you said that we're going to be learning about the Constitution because that's the thing that protects us from the government, right? And uh, corporations are. Well, that's that's one of the major problems we're going to discuss is what happens if the judges that you're going up in front of to try to assert your constitutional rights are in fact corporate lawyers who are working for the, had, were working for the corporations that are paying the legislature to do these things. And the fact of the matter is that that's one of the questions because if in fact you exhaust all of your judicial remedies that are available and all of your peaceful uh, remedies, then the question is what do you have to resort to? Uh, and there's a whole panoply of things. Gene Sharp has written a, a major three volume piece that you should take a look at. There's three volumes uh, that are called the theory of nonviolence. It's a major Harvard study, three volumes laying out the historical steps that have been taken by oppressed people down through history to try to deal with uh, arbitrary uh, and authoritarian government uh, that's under the control of an oligarchy that is actually foisting its power on the, the vast majority of people. And so that those are things you're going to have to take a look at. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting, uh, though it, it bears exploring, uh, that we're at a point where there's no realistic hope of being able to get any of the courts to agree with you uh, on these things. Because, for example, in Chris Hedges' case, uh, the, the judge, an Obama-appointed Democratic Party judge uh, in the federal district court in Manhattan, ruled in favor of the plaintiffs and said, yes, this is completely unconstitutional. You can't do this. The problem is they then appealed it to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals that was made up of other judges, and they, they dismissed it. Uh, and so, the, so the, they've, they've sprinkled these kind of Federalist Society judges, these right-wing judges, all through the court system, and they actually they group up in the appellate courts on three-judge panels to rule against you. And the problem is, at the present time, we have a, uh, a, a four-to-four split at the Supreme Court level between reactionaries and moderates. And then you got Justice Kennedy, which kind of slide, he slides back and forth and back and forth on cases. Uh, and so that you can't really bet on uh, being able to get your constitutional rights protected there either. But we'll, we, will, we will discuss all of that. Okay, first questions from others. Everybody's got, see, these, these are our talkers here, okay. Okay, so we'll, we'll go to the second questions now. Okay, you've had two though. But the, the sec second question. Okay, so you're um, putting forth the claim that we have to do something, we have to organize and have an idea of how to handle this. Um, I was reading an article the other day, I think it was, it was either Washington Post or The Guardian, saying that the Defense Department is categorizing college students as if they're going to radicalize and organize and do something and protest, they're going to categorize them in the same category as terrorists. And so how much do you think the government is organizing this backlog, or organizing against this backlog? Oh, they're, they're, there's no doubt they're organizing. There's no doubt they're organizing. We, we remember, I, I mentioned it in one of the first classes, that uh, way back when, uh, when Reagan was the governor in California, they organized this entire thing called Operation Cable Splicer, uh, in which they were practicing uniting all of the law enforcement agencies in the state 
all the way from local police departments to sheriffs to, uh, to the, to the uh, state police, the highway patrol, and the National Guard working with the United States military, all in California, in the event that the black nationalists joined together with the anti-Vietnam War movement students to try to overthrow the government of California. You know, so they have all these kind of war game scenarios worked out in their mind uh, in that they, there's not the slightest doubt that they believe students and, by the way, college professors uh, to be among the most suspect because they read books uh, and they think uh, and they actually study the Constitution and they actually know how grievous the offenses are that are being committed. And so, the, so right away, we become one of the suspect groups that might well organize. In fact, we were targeted by a thing called Operation Camelot uh, back in 1963 uh, as being a likely group that should not be allowed to meet in, in groups of more than three uh, because that could be considered to be a criminal syndicate. And so that I, wa I want you to keep in mind that in, in, when you're oppressed like this, if in fact you're not becoming suspect on the part of people like that, you ain't doing your job as American citizens. Okay? Now, uh, second questions. No, 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 let me get the kids first. Yes. Yes, um, I don't know your name. Oh, I'm, I'm Sophia. Sophia. Um, and yes, I ask a lot of questions. Um, but what I'm going to say is, obviously, the solution to this, we, we need the government to stop behaving the way it's behaving, and we definitely need them to get out of certain things. Um, the NSA is scary. We need, we definitely, it's not good that they have such a degree of interference in our daily lives. And it's also scary how they seem to be actively targeting political opponents at this point. But the, the other thing is you kind of, you need to, what I find a little bit confusing as I think about it is you need to have some kind of a compromise because you can't just you can't just be libertarian. That's not a solution because then the corporations step into the role of the government. So how do you get the government to regulate the things that they need to and stay out of the things that they don't? What you do is you get rid of corporations. That's easy enough. What you what you do is you 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 get the government to to stop all corporations. There's no reason in the world why anybody should be given immunity against liability for things that they're doing to generate profit for themselves. And so that you back up all the way back into the 1868 or so at the end of the Civil War, when in fact all of these rules and regulations started getting put in that created this strange monster that actually has no conscience, no soul, uh, very extremely limited liability, and what you have to do is do away with that. Now, the fact of the matter is, you asked the second question, is how are you going to get the legislators to agree to get rid of it if they're being paid by them? You know, and that means that you have to get rid of that. You have to get rid of the ability of corporations to give money to legislators. Why do people think people give money to legislators? Because they want them to legislate the way they want for their benefit. So you shouldn't, that's what a bribe is. It's just a straight bribe. So we have to stop doing that. So you have to have public financing of elections. That's another one of the remedies. And we'll cover a lot of these things during the course about what kind of step-by-step uh, things are needed to try to solve the problem. Um, you mentioned that the simple solution is to get like rid of you know these corporations, but um, then what are you suggesting? Because I mean, something like communism, something like where there are no corporations, or are you suggesting a more regulated base for these corporations? No, 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 no. That the, uh, the the opposite poles are not corporations in 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 communism. You know, there's all kinds of businesses that are not corporations. You know, if you and I wanted to form a business that we were going to sell shoes or something like that, we can form a partnership and have a business that isn't a corporation. You and I don't have to have legal liability against, you know, crippling somebody from the shoes that we make uh, in order to make shoes. So that the, 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 the setting up regular business operations, even in, even in fact those that in, in fact have a number of partners in them who share in chipping in the money to run the company, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, the fact of the matter is that's a healthy business. 
and it and it uh, it fosters and promotes the entrepreneurial spirit. It gives people the right to uh, become remunerated for their own skills and tasks, uh, commensurate with their skills and tasks. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But to set up a special, unique animal that immunizes the owners against liability is asking for trouble, because in, in that the and to maximize the short-term profits that are generated by that corporation to be able to distribute those to the, to the shareholders that just sit around clipping coupons is asking for trouble. And so I'm saying that, that's one of the clear solutions that we have. For this. Now it's, it's quarter of, and the rest of the, the other students are coming, so we have to go. Now listen, next Thursday we meet here, but then you just need to be prepared for the section to go back over to Porter, okay?